just like the Thanksgiving edition of the Kansas City Star, we've got a big episode for you today on Sports Beat KC, the Star's daily sports podcast. It's Wednesday, November 25th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. We've crammed three colleges and many topics into one show. Kansas basketball leads things off. The Jayhawks are ranked sixth nationally and take on top ranked Gonzaga on Thursday in Florida. These were the nation's top two teams when the 2020 season ended before the NCAA tournament because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Beat writers Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell are here to break down the game and KU. Kansas State beat writer Kellis Robinette tells us what the problems were for the Wildcats in last weekend's shutout loss at Iowa State. There were many. But K-State takes on a Baylor team this weekend that's lost five straight after winning its opener. We also talk some hoops with Kellis. The Cats open today at 1 o'clock against Drake. Missouri has changed football opponents this week, a very COVID-19 thing to do. Soichi Tirada tells us who the Tigers were scheduled to play when the week started and who Mizzou will see on the field on Saturday. We also talked some basketball with Suichi with the Tigers returning nearly every player from last year's team. Missouri opens tonight against Oral Roberts. So here we go with the fat edition of Sports Beat KC, pun intended, on this day before Thanksgiving, starting with Jesse and Gary. What's up, guys? It is basketball season. KU starting a day later than a lot of schools, but kind of an odd start day, right? Thanksgiving day on uh, about 1230 central time, but um, but as usual, a pretty difficult opponent, right, Gary? Yeah, they open with Gonzaga, which will be only the second time in history they've ever played them. You might have been there, Blair. They came to KU in 94 season. I was I was trying to remember if I had covered a Gonzaga game because I read that note that's only the second time these programs will have met. A little bit surprising to think about, but uh, I could not remember Kansas playing Gonzaga. And I I remember a lot of the KU games I covered or, or went to, and I could not remember them playing Gonzaga. I think KU won the game, though. Yeah, and I think they beat them by 19 or 20. But uh, Gonzaga finished last season ranked number two in the AP poll. KU finished number one. Both teams were expected to make the final four. And uh, you can't just assume this is a national title game from a year ago because both teams are a little bit different. So two big name programs, though, supposedly will play Thursday in Florida. Yeah, Fort Myers is the is the place. Um, Jesse, have you gotten to your game breakdown yet? No quick scout yet, but uh, looking into it, uh, that'll obviously be coming out either late Wednesday or early Thursday for people wanting to check it out, KU fans wanting to check it out, or gamblers wanting to check it out because I think it, it sometimes draws all three audiences. But uh, I, you know, I think for speaking honestly, you know, Gary kind of summed it up pretty well. These two teams are really good last year. These two teams are supposed, you know, expect to be really good this year. Gonzaga's preseason number one, KU's number six. So about as good of a matchup as you could start off the season with. But I guess if you're diving in a little bit closer or deeper into these teams, you would just say that if you're going to give an experience edge, if you're going to say, hey, we probably know a little bit more about one team compared to the other, it's probably Gonzaga because they return more pieces from last year. They have more known in the quantity, if you will. And, you know, Kansas, after losing Devon Dotson and Yudoka Azabuki, they just have more guys where you're not exactly sure what you're going to get yet. And, and I mean, if you just listed off their roster right now, you could probably say that about seven or eight different guys. You know, you say, okay, Jalen Wilson, well, not sure. He played a few minutes last year. Tristan and Aruna, well, he played a little bit, but you're not really sure what you're going to get. And then, you know, Tyon Grant Foster, Bryce Thompson. Um, you know, you just kind of go on down the line. Dewan Harris. Uh, there's so many guys on Kansas that could be great players, could be contributors, or could be ones that are a little bit behind here early, the early portion of the season. Now that would really surprise you. So I, I think um, if you're kind of looking at it from that perspective, it, we might over... You know, we might overanalyze that a little bit, especially when you haven't seen any of the teams out there play yet. And obviously COVID throws a lot into the mix as well. But uh, I would say that Gonzaga probably is the more known quantity at this point. And Kansas, it's going to be a little bit more of a wild card. Yeah, I, I think the Zags deserve their preseason number one. They're, they're number one in the AP poll and Baylor is number one in the coaches poll with Gonzaga number two. But 
and Baylor's number two in AP with Villanova, Virginia, Iowa ahead of KU. I, yeah, I, I think that's fair. And but listen, Kansas is used to opening up against you know top ranked opponents. That, that's that's what the Champions Classic has been about for however long that's been going on. It's either Kentucky, Duke, or Michigan State, or you know the Kansas always plays somebody tough right off the jump. And how did Gary? How did this game? come about was this was this a COVID-19 pandemic arranged game or had they yeah. been talking about meeting yeah this was a COVID game um they were supposed to play the wooden legacy in uh, Orlando and open with Boise State and it would be a real tournament and then play either UCLA or Seton Hall uh that got called off by ESPN I don't think they liked the conferences uh covid restrictions or something they didn't feel comfortable hosting a turn any of their tournaments this year uh so self and mark few quickly put this together but the original opener obviously was the champions classic like you said against kentucky and that was november 10th but that got pushed back by when the ncaa delayed the start of the season so uh, this thing got moved to be- Fort Myers instead of Orlando, but ESPN had nothing to do with this one. Okay, because it's on. Well, it's on Fox for one yeah. thing. Um, and 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 the Kentucky game is going to happen, right? The the, the Kansas yeah, will play Tuesday, Tuesday in Indianapolis, uh, and I think there are no fans for that one, so they decided okay. to play that in Indy. Let's uh, while we're while we're on the topic of no fans, let's just cover that really quick. Uh, announcement earlier this week. We're recording this on Tuesday, by the way. So when I asked Jesse about his um, his quick scout, uh, that'll that'll be in the Thursday paper. He just hasn't done it yet. So uh, it always it always appears in the paper, and I always enjoy reading it. So, uh, so what did what did KU say about uh, about fans in Allen Fieldhouse, Gary? Um. 1,500 fans, but no fans for the first two games was announced yesterday. So uh, the chancellor, with his medical background and working with uh, the KU system, uh, has decided that through December 5th, no fans at any KU home events. So Washburn game and North Dakota State, no fans if they ever do have fans, it'll be capped at fifteen hundred. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, uh, Jesse, I, I I did enjoy your film breakdown of of late night. The what was it? Ten minute scrimmage, however long it was, just a short scrimmage. But you managed to find some clips of Kansas newcomers. I think everybody's kind of curious about these these three guys in particular: Bryce Thompson, Tyne Grant Foster, and Dewan Harris. What what did uh, what you know? What can you? You can't do much, and I'm sure you're really looking forward to you know seeing Kansas in action on Thursday and Friday just to just to get more film on these guys. But what what did you see in the short um, you know film that you that you're able to break down? Yeah, and Bill Self has been talking about these guys, and I think overall when he gives evaluations, he tends to be uh, pretty honest and sometimes brutally honest. And I think what he's said so far about these guys mostly lined up with what went into that late night scrimmage, which again was shot even a couple uh, a couple weeks before the actual late night thing was aired. So this we're talking about a very preliminary scrimmage on one of the first days of official practice. So you really do have to be careful about uh, you know how much you take from it. But yeah, Bryce Thompson seemed to show really good instincts. You know, he's the son of a coach, obviously. His dad played for Bill Self, so uh, there was a defensive play in there that I noted that um, he really had good recognition and kind of blew up the play and then recovered to his man really well. Some of those things that you usually see from like juniors and seniors, the Marcus Garrett types, but seeing that from a true freshman, I think it's encouraging for Kansas. He also had a really good play on a a pick and roll where, um, you know, he broke down Marcus Garrett, of all people, uh, you know, the national defensive reigning player of the year, uh, got to the lane and then uh, made a nice pass outside to get a guy an open three. So those are the type of plays KU might not have had as much with Devon Dotson last year, who was much better at getting to the rim himself and finishing. Uh, If you can get sort of that thing with a a combo guard and Bryce Thompson, that's going to be a big benefit for Kansas. And he seems further along maybe than you would expect a typical true freshman. 
Um, Tom Grant Foster just seems uber talented. I mean, the guy can jump. He's quick twitch. He seems like he can get a shot off at any time. It's sort of like, you know, he kind of does this hesitation move and rises up with his shot, and he's, it's released before you can even challenge it. So he can get off very difficult shots. I think the problem for Kansas is, for right now, he seems to be kind of the opposite of Bryce. He's maybe a step behind, thinking a little bit too much, trying to figure out where he's supposed to be. And also, uh, you know, I'm mentioning this now, but if you've got a lot of guys that are trying these very tough step back mid-range jumpers it's gonna be sort of difficult for your offense to hum along at an efficient rate just because those are some of the most difficult shots in basketball there's a reason uh, that nba teams have gone away from that and then dewan harris you know bill self always compliments him on his passing it's a little bit rough early on he made some kind of bad decisions in the pick and roll but uh, he made a really good one late when it came to you know finding the right guy and and like i said before you know for kansas this is gonna be a little bit different because devon dotson was very very good at some different things you know running to the other end using his speed, um, getting to, to a right-handed layup, which he made almost all the time. But he was not amazing at finding passes out of pick-and-roll situations. So with Dewan Harris and Bryce Thompson, potentially that's kind of an area where KU can in- increase uh, its offensive production that maybe it didn't have as much a year ago. Still having said that, it's going to be very difficult to replace Yudoka Azubuki, Devon Dotson. and they're going to miss those guys, especially early. But uh, that was kind of a first glimpse at those newcomers. And like I said, for the most part, what Bill Self has been saying about them, I think that mostly held up to be true. Okay, and Gary, it sounds like it seems like one of those guys will be the fifth starter for for the Jayhawks when they open up on on Thursday. Who do you have as the as the starting lineup? Uh, Ochai, Baji, Marcus Garrett, Christian Brown, David McCormack, and then uh, trying to figure out what self self will do. Uh, I think if these guys are healthy, he will go with Bryce Thompson just because of the recruitment. McDonald's All-American really out-recruited a lot of people to get him to come here, loyal to the family. He know he coached Bryce's dad. Maybe give him a shot from day one. But Self keeps implying that Tyon Grant Foster is this amazing scorer and Self may need that badly against Gonzaga, which is known as a team that is better on offense than defense. But I'm, I think I'm going to be wrong, but I'll predict Bryce Thompson. Okay, got another prediction question for you. Um, so this will be the last podcast we do before Kansas opens its season, assuming that there is a season and we get through yeah. it and there's, or there's some, you know, they, they play enough games and we get to a tournament. Who's going to end up as KU's leading scorer this year? Jesse, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I think my answer changes. I think I've been on a couple podcasts um, lately where, you know, you, you get asked that and, and probably you've asked me that, Blair, is what I'm kind of recalling. And I probably said something. Um, I, I'm going to stick with Ochai Abaji. I, I think I really like his minutes floor because Bill Self trusts him defensively, and I love his shot. I think his three-point shot is really, really good. It might not happen every game. He not, might not get you know, 15, 15, 15, 15, but I think when he's on, he can be sort of a volume guy from three-point range, and I think he's going to play so many minutes that he'll kind of catch up that way. I think the obvious other answer would be David McCormick. Bill Self said himself uh, in a press conference earlier this week that that's who he would guess would be the leading scorer, and he's going to take a bunch of shots. Like I said before, though, there's a difference between taking shots and being efficient, and I think that's kind of the question that KU is going to have. I mean, David McCormick can shoot 18-foot jumpers all day, but there's another thing is whether you want him to actually do that because your offense will not be as efficient as it potentially could be. So I'll stick with Ochai, but again, the fact that Bill Self said it's probably going to be David McCormick, it doesn't make me uh, too encouraged that my pick is going to be right. What do you think, Gary? Uh, I would think it'll be a guard. Uh, McCormick may get into foul trouble a lot, so... Jesse's pick is probably pretty good because last year Dotson led him at 18. I doubt Marcus Garrett will lead them. He's the new point. So if Ochai has improved his outside shot and can hit three to four threes a game, he would be a good bet because everybody else, you just don't know about minutes. And one thing that was consistent last year was Ochai will get a ton of minutes. Yeah, he, he he's the top returning scorer at 10 a game, and McCormick at 6.9, 4.1 rebounds. So 
Okay, we'll leave it at that, except to say that KU has a football game on Saturday, playing TCU in Lawrence, uh, one of three scheduled remaining games for the Jayhawks. So, hey, Gary Bedore, Jesse Newell, great catching up with you guys, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks, Blair. Thank you. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Kellis, I want to talk about the basketball team and the season here, but I don't think we can start talking about Kansas State sports without beginning with what in the world happened in Ames, Iowa last weekend. And I, I just hadn't seen a Chris Kleiman team lose in that fashion. What happened? Yeah, I mean, that was a new one for everybody involved. It was the uh, worst loss that Chris Kleiman has ever had as a head coach. It was the worst loss that Kansas State has had, period, since uh, 2015 when Baker Mayfield in Oklahoma came in here and to Manhattan and 155-0, and it's the first time Kansas State has lost uh, by shutout to Iowa State since 1978 in a uh, bizarrely in a series they've completely owned for the last 13 years. So this was kind of uh, the bully uh, or the bullied turning into the bully here and just uh, taking man just kicking the sand, kicking some sand in Kansas State's face. So it was uh, it was bizarre to see, but it was just I think a kind of a perfect storm of factors. We all know Kansas State was dealing with a lot of COVID issues last week. They took the field without both their starting linebackers. They're also missing one of their best receivers, and uh, you know, down three starters, losing those three guys doesn't necessarily explain why Iowa State was so dominant, winning forty five zero. But uh, I think Kansas State knew going into this game if they were going to win, they had to take an early lead. They had to play with them uh, in the first quarter, and they couldn't do it. They fell behind uh, 14-0. They uh, let Iowa State score touchdowns in their first two drives, and the the one opportunity they had to score themselves, they got turned away at the goal line on fourth down. So I think just right there, they knew, boy, we missed our one one opportunity to make this a game, and then it snowballed on them. And by the end of it, you're looking up, and you're scratching your head saying, boy, that really got out of hand. Yeah, yeah. And now we've got us a, a real live quarterback situation in Manhattan. Uh, yeah. Will Howard went to the bench. Uh, coach's decision before halftime. Nick asked, "Finish it up." What? What? Uh, where does it stand now? Uh, we don't know for sure. The only clue that Chris Kleiman has said is that he expects to give most of the first team reps to Will Howard this week, assuming that he's healthy enough to take them. So that would make you think he's for now leaning towards starting Will Howard. The true freshman uh, once again at Baylor on Saturday, but he's had three opportunities now to name Will Howard the starter. Um, he was asked after immediately after the game on Monday, and then again today if he knew who was going to start the game, and he said that he does not. So the door is open for Nick Ost. Um, if there's a time for him to step up and start a game and show what he he can do, this is his week to do it. I think they're gonna you know wait and just see how both quarterbacks practice this week. And make a decision later, you know, Thursday or something like that. And who knows? Maybe we see both of them. Okay. Thank you for pron- for correcting my pronunciation. It's Ost, Nick Ost. Yeah. Sorry weird, pronunci- weird pronunciation looks like Ast, just spelled A S T. So uh, gotcha. he's a former walk on from Cimarron, uh, an all around good guy. Everybody says great things about him. Um, unfortunately, he didn't really lift the offense any better than Will Howard did last week. Took a lot of sacks, scored zero points. So. It's not a great. It's not a great situation. It's not like he's uh, choosing between you know Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray here. Um, they'd much rather play Skylar Thompson. Than <laughs> right, right. Hey, and something else that um, that I thought about, and you and you did write about this after the game is, look, there have been a lot of uh, in addition to COVID nineteen pandemic issues. There just have been some 
you know, more than the usual amount of transfers out of the program. And, you know, it, they didn't all happen at once. It happened over, you know, several weeks and months. And, uh, but, but it starts, it's starting to add up a little bit. And, the tone of some of the players after the game was such that maybe they they feel like they're in a you know backs are to the wall and maybe have to overcome a little adversity right now. Yeah, that was interesting. Interesting to hear before we heard uh, Deuce Vaughn and Cody Fletcher both separately say that they thought that was a distraction to see ten players over the course of a few months enter the transfer portal. Um, you know, it, it was a, a hot topic around these parts. Is it a big deal? Is it not a very big deal at all? It's just really hard to gauge because there are more transfers than usual out there this season. There's something like 650 people in the NCAA transfer portal right now, which is about triple what it normally is. Um, And, you know, a lot of it can be explained. There's COVID going on. Players are unhappy. It's not the greatest time to to be a college student or a college athlete. So it's understandable that a lot of players might look, uh, you know, transfer closer to home or if they're unhappy just go that route, especially with new uh, rules coming through that, um, should allow players to transfer without sitting out here next season. So it, it's just an interesting thing, but you know, as, as much as you can explain it away, losing 10 guys um, is, is abnormal for Kansas state. That's the highest number in the big 12. It's one of the highest numbers in the country. And uh, I, I think that kind of what they were getting at is just that a lot of players, when um, they faced adversity this season, rather than sticking it out and saying, you know what, um, I'm going to push a little harder and do what's best for the team. They're just outright leaving. You know, they're, they're not even showing up for practice and maybe not taking on leadership roles. They're just saying to heck with this and leaving. So I think that's where the, you know, the distraction thing come, came from is that it just kind of got into some people's heads that not everybody is uh, rowing the boat the same way here. Not everybody is totally committed to the team, but it sounds like at least over the last 48 hours, they've hashed some of that out and uh, got come come together a little bit more than they were previously. Interesting. Okay, so it's three consecutive losses for Kansas State, two by you know lopsided margins. Uh, they lost at West Virginia by by twenty seven. Uh, really lost an opportunity for a great win uh, against Oklahoma State, and then and then of course the Iowa State loss drops them to four and four overall, four and three in Big Twelve play. So still over five hundred in conference play. Um, Baylor is next on the schedule. Baylor's behind him in the standings. Baylor hasn't won since defeating Kansas in its first game. So I, I would think, uh, yes, there is uh, some uncertainty at quarterback and in other areas, but a victory opportunity for the Wildcats on Saturday. Yeah, ba- Baylor is the favorite here. Um, they opened uh, minus five um, in the Vegas odds this week. So I certainly – no means is it an easy task, but it's definitely the most winnable game left on the season. Like you said, everybody but Kansas has beaten Baylor this year. It's just been a very difficult situation for new coach Dave Aranda down there. Didn't get spring ball, didn't get a non-conference game because it was canceled because of COVID. They uh, lost a game to Oklahoma State, I believe, because of COVID. So they've played less than anybody. They've had less time around their coach than anybody. Um, if ever there was a time for Kansas State to get right, um, even on the road, this is it. Baylor is no powerhouse team this season without Matt Rule. So, um, yeah, it, there's a lot for Kansas State still to play for. They can finish with six six wins in conference play, which would be really good. Um, they just got to go out and find a way to do it. Okay. Hey, let's switch sports. Uh, we're, you and I are talking on Tuesday afternoon, less than 24 hours away from the Wildcats' hoop opener. They play Drake at home at uh, 1 o'clock on Wednesday and I'm reading that there is a particular freshman to keep an eye on in this game. There's a lot of people to keep an eye on, but <laughs> a a freshman who will stand out for no other reason than he's is his height, but he's also been pretty good in practice. Tell us about him. Yeah, um Davion Bradford, he's a seven footer from St. Louis. And I've uh you know the recruiting experts have said this is Bruce Weber's best uh class that he's brought in since he's been at Kansas State with Selton Miguel. Nigel Pack um, and Bradford, who are all four-star recruits, highly, very highly regarded players, all top 150 last year. But the guy I've always kind of had my eye on most was Bradford because he's the kind of player that, uh, just for whatever reason, Kansas State hasn't had lately, which is a, a big, tall rim protector in the front court who um, can not only play some defense but actually catch the ball, make some moves in the paint, and score and finish, which is something that um, – 
you know, no offense to the guys they've played over the last couple of years. They just haven't had. It's always been an adventure to see if they can even uh, hang on to the ball when they're getting entry passes. So it's uh, it, it's a new era in Kansas State. I'm not sure exactly what in the world to expect on the basketball court on Wednesday. We haven't seen him scrimmage. We haven't seen him play an exhibition game. Um, even Bruce Weber says there have been times where they've only had like seven or eight guys available at practice because of COVID and other injuries. But the one thing he said about uh, been consistent about through all of it is that he's very he's been very very impressed with Bradford. He's lost like 25 pounds since he's arrived on campus, so he's about seven feet, 250 pounds. Um, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to see, seeing what he can do, even if he is coming off the bench as a true freshman. Uh, I, I just think that having a rim protector and a guy who can finish uh, just brings a whole new element to this team, and it's something we haven't seen in a long while. Well, I'm with you on that. That's uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing him in, in action. So, all right, Kellis, great catching up, and we'll talk to you again next week. All right, Blair. See you then. Okay, I've got Missouri playing Saturday, and I'm kind of sure about the opponent, but not 100%. Just like last week, we were kind of sure the game was going to happen, but not 100%. So, Suichi Tirada, tell us who the Missouri Tigers are playing in football on Saturday. Yes, if you had asked me yesterday, it would have been the Arkansas Razorbacks, but today on Tuesday, it is, or I guess this is posting Wednesday, but... It is now the Vanderbilt Commodores. We're, tra- we're transparent. We're recording Tuesday, but uh, posting Wednesday. And yes, again, it is a different opponent than than what we entered the week with, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, Vanderbilt. Everything is actually the same except for the opponent. It is still at 11 a.m. and this or Memorial Stadium on SEC Network. So all of that is still the same except except just the opponent is different in Vanderbilt. Um, I think actually it's it's. You know, if, if you're going to have an opponent opponent changed, I guess, the Monday of, of the game week ahead of your Saturday game, Vanderbilt is, is probably the one opponent you, you kind of hope for. You know, you're not game planning for a Florida, Georgia, or Alabama. It is the 0-7 Vanderbilt Commodores. So I guess if there's a silver lining, it's that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that would be a fan's perspective on this. I was really looking forward to a Missouri-Arkansas game just because I – I've, I've admired what both programs have done this year, um, the the, tur- the turnarounds of, of both programs. Arkansas is probably even more impressive than Missouri. I mean, Arkansas was behind Missouri, um, has been for the last few years, and Sam Pittman's just done a terrific job turning it around, just as Le- Eli Drinkwitz has done at Missouri. So what are the um, what are the chances of Missouri and Arkansas playing this season? How and So there's there are two games that Missouri has had – postponed or re- rescheduled and what's what's left for uh on what's a, a for, for a, in terms of availability on the schedule for for the tigers yeah so it's kind of messy so first and foremost the thing we can kind of knock out is that mizzou plays at mississippi state december 5th so that's kind of set in stone no i get no need to i guess move that as of now obviously with COVID, we don't know that but so when when mizzou and vanderbilt was we're supposed to be rescheduled. It's supposed to be December twelfth, but that was all tentative, just because essentially, you know, you never know what happens. But now Mizzou, luckily, because the Vanderbilt game was moved, they have December twelfth and December nineteenth officially the the same date as the SEC championship game to make up those Arkansas and Georgia games, as you mentioned, Blair. So it, it's kind of convenient. Those technically aren't like officially rescheduled, just because the SEC still has to kind of play around with that. But as of now. December 12th, December 19th, Georgia or Arkansas, they can fit it in there. The nice thing, too, is that um, essentially like the new rule changes, Blair, makes it so that Mizzou is able to, or I guess the SEC is able to kind of play around with the schedule as they see fit just just so teams are able to fit it just because had had the Mizzou-Arkansas game been postponed and Mizzou didn't have an opponent this weekend, then we're looking at essentially I, I don't think Mizzou would have been able to fit in 10 games. So that was a recent rule change. I think the date was November 13th or 14th. The SEC officially was like, okay, we're doing this for the rest of the season. So just just with the timing and everything, they were able to make it work, which is uh, very fortunate for Mizzou that uh, they were the one team kind of being hit over and over again with scheduling changes. And uh, if they're still on track to play 10 games, which is, uh, you know, despite opponents changing, I, I think you're kind of fortunate to look at it that way. Oh, I think it'd be remarkable if if 
we're looking at back on this season, saw where Missouri played 10 regular season games, given all the obstacles that were presented to them. Um, their most recent game was a victory, 17 to 10 over South Carolina um, in Columbia, South Carolina. What did you like best about uh, Missouri's effort in that game? You know, I, I think the defense played great, Blair. You know, the thing is, too, it, there, there are definitely some, you know, criticisms coming out of that game, especially in the second half. I mean, the offense just wasn't moving the ball. And I asked Drinkwitz about it this after the game, what, what didn't work. And he kind of plainly pointed to the running game. And I think, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to criticize even that area just because you have two spots in the O-line. You're on your third string left guard and Luke Griffin making his first career start. You're on your second string right tackle. Um, and, and so you, you look at that and you, you're kind of looking at it in perspective, right? Because Mizzou was under the SEC roster threshold of 53 players. They actually had 52. So you have all these things where you're like, well, you know, you, you didn't play great against the South Carolina team, fire coach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but at the end of the day, the fact that they got in the game, the fact that they won with 52 players, the fact that they, you know, it, it looked kind of dicey, especially on maybe the last drive, but the fact that they also kind of ended it on an interception and, and got into victory formation. I think you look at that and you, you, you want to breathe a sigh of relief because it was a very vulnerable game and you walked out of it. But like I said, you know, the fact that you did it with 52 players, I think is kind of remarkable because if Mizzou really, really wanted to and said, Hey, we're under the SEC threshold, let, let's reschedule what they could have. But I, I think, you know, drink what's in, in the Tigers being able to even play that game and come out of it as a win was, was just remarkable in many ways yeah evened up uh the tigers record right at three and three and i know in some circles there was uh, a lot of skepticism about missouri coming into the season some some uh, uh betting houses had the uh, missouri's over under at two or two and a half um and they have surpassed that so not a bad thing for the tigers to um you know to get to three wins and i think there are more victory opportunities awaiting them, starting with Saturday's game at Vanderbilt. Uh, But of more immediate concern for Missouri is basketball. The men's basketball team starts on Wednesday. Uh, Oral Roberts is the first opponent. A lot of, uh, I think, a lot of curiosity about this Missouri basketball team with a consensus being, um, you know, look, we know that the circumstances are strange and conditions are odd for everyone in college basketball with the pandemic. But um, this Missouri Tigers team ought to be better than last year simply because just about everybody's back. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest question with, with this Mizzou team, right, Blair? It's just that, yes, you have everyone bring, you bring everyone back, but is that necessarily a good thing? I, I personally think so. I, I had them, I think right around 6th or 7th on my SEC media poll, I believe 6th. So I think they will make that jump. They finished uh, 10th last year out of a kind of a tiebreaker scenario. But I'm I really, I, I'm really curious just to see what some players look like just because you can say all the right things before the season, but obviously you know, the final result will be in wins and losses. And you, you look at a few players on this team, and I think there are there is some talent, but I'm, I'm, I'm just – I'm so curious to see how they look just because you look at a guy like Xavier Pinson, he goes on an absolute tear. You know, the last nine games of the season, I believe it was 18.8 points per game, which is, you know, he, he reset his career high in, in three straight home games, which I think was, was kind of cool to see. So you look at a guy like Pinson, you look at a guy like Jeremiah Tillman, who's entering his senior year, you look at all, you know, second team all SEC guard, Drew Smith. You look at a guy like Mark Smith, who who's a great shooter, and you, you see so many pieces where it's so easy to envision this Mizzou team succeeding and, and things going as Conzo and Martin wants it to. And you look at the second half of the SEC schedule, they play, they play faster. There's a schematic change. There, there are so many things that you're like, okay, this is kind of – it's looking good. It looks like it's turning around the corner. I'm sure the pandemic canceled the season, but you feel good during the offseason just because of who you bring back and – and Mitchell Smith, Jeremiah Tillman, and Pinson all coming back from the NBA draft process. And once again, you know, like I say, like I said, you know, there's so many good things to look at, but it's it's just about fitting it at this point, I think. And Conzo Martha made a great point when we spoke to him the past few weeks in the sense that he he really believes his experience is a good thing in the sense that they've had to deal with injuries. You know, like when Jeremiah Tillman went down last year, they had to pretty much overhaul the offensive system just because he was such a big part of it. And being able to adjust on the fly, I think, is is really going to be important during a pandemic. You know, 
during COVID-19. So I think just between all of those factors, experience and actual proven experience, I, I think you, you're looking pretty good about this season. And, and hopefully Mizzou fans, you know, get, get to see something a lot better than uh, at times last year when the offense slowed down and, you know, you lose to Charleston Silver and all these things. So, but I, I think if you're a fan, you, you feel pretty good going into Wednesday's game. They need to shoot it better, don't they, from the perimeter? That's that's kind of my concern for Missouri going in. They were a sub-30% uh, three-point shooting team last cool. year. Yeah. Um, that'll that, – that that'll force you to play in different you know different ways different styles if you if you're not a great shooting team so um, that 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 absolutely absolutely needs to occur but let me ask you who is instead of asking you who you think will end up being the scoring leader I mean Drew Smith is back he led the team in scoring last year Xavier Pinson and uh, Mark Smith they all you know double digit scores so you assume that that'll you know it'll stay somewhere around there Tillman you know close to, to double digits but who who among the returning players sees the biggest improvement who, who takes a, a step up goes to a, another level in their game this season Blair uh it's someone if any KU fans are listening he might sound a little familiar because I think Parker Brown is is a guy that you really look at and and Conzo Martin has said it multiple times that Parker's kind of been that one guy who's seen the most improvement and we saw flashes of it last year when when he played kind of backup minutes um, yeah. for Reed Nico yeah. so uh, you know, I, I'm really curious to see how Parker does. We we spoke to him briefly a couple weeks ago, and he I asked him specifically like, "What what is his role?" Because you know, at his height, he can just play Tillman's backup minutes. But he kind of said it depends on you know who they're playing, and he can kind of stroke it a little bit. I don't. We didn't see too much of that last year, but if, if he added you know a three point ball to his game, maybe look a little bit like his uh, brother and everything. So I, I, you know, I'm really curious to see how Parker does. Uh, unfortunately, no border war, so he can't go up against his brother, but. I think he's one guy who Ms. I, I think Mizzou's really excited about and, and will be a pleasant surprise for fans. Okay, sounds good, Suichi. Hey, appreciate the catch-up, and we will talk to you again next week. All right, happy Thanksgiving, Blair. You too. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. A tip of the cap to... Jesse Newell, Gary Bedore, Kellis Robinette, and Suichi Tirada for stopping by and talking college sports. Links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we've got another deal for you, especially for those that want to deep dive into the Star's terrific Chiefs coverage. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. How do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? I know I do. Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented teammates, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And if you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, send me an email, bkirkhoff at kcstar.com, and I'll get you to the right place. Whether it's a sports pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. We'll be back on Friday. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving, but we'll be back on Friday to talk Chiefs, who take on the Tampa Bay Bucks on Sunday. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you then.